Good morning. Welcome to the One Year Bible Study. We're on March the 24th. This has been a powerful week in our Bible studies, and it just continues on. And I love in these Bible studies just our daily readings in the morning with the Lord that He's revealing Himself to us, um, that we're getting to see an intimate side of God um, through all of His emotions. The same emotions that He's given to us, He oftentimes displays, uh, such as anger. We've seen anger from the Lord. Uh, in these Old Testament readings, I praise God for the blood of Jesus that keeps his wrath away from us now um, because we don't have to fear God's wrath. Um, we're covered by the blood of Jesus, and Jesus took that wrath. Every bit of anger God ever had towards us uh, was taken on by Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God, on the cross, and through those stripes he took. But but anyway, it's getting a, it's, we get to see his heart. We get to see God's heart. And so here we are, it's still Moses and those Israelites. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. Um, we're in Deuteronomy, uh, the second chapter, for, through the third chapter, verse 29. Mm-hmm. And so God's leading the Israelites through Moses. He speaks to Moses and he tells them what to do. And they're journeying into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. He tells them when to turn north. He tells them when to turn right. He tells them when to get off the mountain. <laughs> When to go around the mountain. And and remember yesterday we read that God was angry with them and that because of the Israelites' disobedience and because of Moses' continuous intercession for them, that God's anger was on Moses to the point he wouldn't get to go over to the crop up to the promised land. And we see that reinforced today. But so here early in the reading, uh, verse two, Deuteronomy two in Verse 7, I I want you to see the heart of our Father. So even though, reminds me so much of our kids, even though our kids mess up, even though we get just spitting mad at them sometimes, um, even though we can just get so frustrated, we still love our kids. And how much more does our Father love us? And it's displayed here in verse 7. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all. I love that word all. It it does not leave out anything. All the work of your hands. Now he's talking to the Israelites. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. God may have been angry enough that at times he killed a whole bunch of them. We've, we've read where God's wrath opened up the heavens, the earth, I mean, opened up the earth and swallowed them. We've read about the plagues that's come out against them and has killed thousands of them. But in spite of it all, he continues to love them. He continues to bless them. And this is before Jesus Christ. Um, so that was very profound to me. And then we go on. Um, talking about again it's the traveling he's he's sending them different places he's telling them how uh they're he's going to send them into the land of esau and giving them some specific instructions uh about where he's sending them um and then in verse uh 30 i want to just talk about that for a minute because god instructed them to go he instructed them what to say and what to do. And then when they did it, verse 30, but Sihon, the king of Eshbon, would not let us pass by him. For the Lord your God, your God, for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate. So God sent him in knowing that God was going to harden his heart and wouldn't let him uh, pass through. And it's like, Okay, what sense does that make? I mean, why would God send them in and then harden his heart and not let him go in? And, and, and again, we don't live by sight. We live by faith. We live by the word of God. And, and, and this is just a reminder to us that, you know, I may think I want this particular job and I don't get it. I, I mean, God may have even told me to put in for this particular job and I don't get it. It doesn't mean that we're not still in the perfect will of God. It doesn't mean that we didn't hear to do what we're doing, which is so applicable to where I'm at today. <laughs> I know that I know I heard to do what I'm doing. And 
sometimes hearts are, hearts are hardened and sometimes hearts are hardened by God. So what if God told them to go um, just simply to test their obedience and they went and then he hardened their hearts and it just simply tested their faith? I, I mean, really and truly, how strong is our faith until it's tested? I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't give us an explanation exactly on why God hardened their heart. But I wanted to point out here that it was God who hardened the, the, the hearts of this, this man that wouldn't let him travel in. And so it goes on to say then uh, uh, that he might give him into your hand as he is this day. God wanted to make sure they knew it was God. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have begun to give Sihon and his land over to you. Begin to take possession that you may occupy this land. Now remember, God told them to go. So they asked permission to go. God hardened Sihon's heart and he wouldn't let him go. And yet God comes right back and says, This is the beginning. I'm going, I'm going to give you this land. You're going to possess this land. Yes, I want to hear. Well, no, because before that, you gave them specific instructions. You're going to go. Uh huh. And you're not going to try, you're not going to fight. Mm hmm. You're going to pay for everything that you take. Yes. This is not going to be your land. Specific instructions. You did. You gave them specific instructions. And then he hardens the heart. And then he says, okay, now I'm going to give you the land. Yeah. Now, now I'm going to give you the land. So it was only after their obedience, but it was also only after their trusting his word. Because in the flesh, it didn't look like they were going to go into this land. Uh, and then we read on in today's reading, um, and, and let's jump down to chapter 3, uh, verse 2. But the Lord said to me, do not fear him. I, in fact, let's just start in verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then we turned and went up to the way to Bashan, and, the, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle us. But the Lord said to me, do not fear him. Now, why do you think God told Moses and the Israelites not to fear him? Do you think it was because they were full of courage and, and when this king came against them that they had all the confidence in the world that's going to overtake him? I believe God told them not to fear him because they, he knew they were in fear. He knew they were in fear. God knows what we think and what we feel before we ever know we're going to think it and feel it. And so God used his words to tell them not to fear. I don't know about y'all, but I have a tendency to read these scriptures. And again, I just read the words on a paper. I'm reading historical facts of events that actually happened. And I can read through this battle like this and just think, oh, okay. So God told them, told them not to fear. They went in, they won the battle. That's not what they lived day by day by day. God told them to go, and the resistance came, and fear set in. Now, how many of that have y'all have ever had that happen? You know you've heard from God, and you know you're doing what God says, and then the resistance comes. That's why the Bible tells us. That's why we have to keep reminding ourselves. We live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith. We live by the word of God. The word of God is our sustenance. What has he said to you lately? Did you write it down? Write down what he's telling you. Go back, go back to that rhema word that he spoke to you when he said, and you know what God told me, let's see, 17 years ago, 17 years ago, God told me that he's taking care of my sons. Just, it was the very first time I ever felt like God spoke to me. First time an extremely bad situation was, was happening. I, I, I really and truly thought my son was going to go to prison on a felony charge, and I didn't know how to help. I didn't know what to do. I just brand new back on my path with the Lord again, and I cried out. I sat in my great big recliner in my living room, and I just cried out and said, God, I don't know what to do. What's going to happen? I'm full of fear full of fear. And I heard him speak gently to my spirit, Elizabeth. They were mine before they were yours. Talking about my children. They were mine before they were yours. They're still mine. And I'm taking care of your sons. And you know how many times I've had to go back to that, including just recently? They were his before they were mine. They're still his. And, and, and I don't live by 
by sight. I live by faith, not by sight. In each one of these stories, uh, do not fear him, for I have given him and all his people in this land into your hand. Now, did they have it right then and there? They did not. A battle ensued. They had to fight. People were killed. A war raged. And you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, the king of the Amorites who lived in Heshbon. So the Lord our God gave into our hand Og also. See, just from, from verse 1 down to verse 3, I can read through that so fast and think, oh, okay, so there was a battle. God told them to go. They went. They won the battle. And I just brush it off instead of listening to what he's telling me. All through here, he's telling me the resistance will come. The resistance comes. I tell you to go. I tell you to do. And the resistance comes. And then there is a battle. We may not be using swords and guns and knives to fight our battle in the physical, but we are under spiritual warfare all the time. 60 cities. 60 cities. They went through 60 cities. Wow. So how many of y'all have had 60 battles? I guarantee you, if you're of any age at all, and even if you're not, <laughs> we've had 60 battles. And they won them all. We don't live by, by sight. We don't live by how it looks in the flesh. We live by faith. And our, our faith cometh by hearing the word of God. It's why it's important that we get together and we do these kind of Bible studies. It's why it's important that we fellowship <laughs> at our church with our church family. It's important why every morning I get up and I'm listening to um, a pastor or a preacher or a teacher or somebody I trust speak God's word into me as I'm putting my makeup on, as I'm getting ready. Every morning, junk in, junk out. And, and if I get up and I listen to... The kind of music I used to listen to, my whole day starts off different. Oh, I'm telling you. But when I start off and, you know, I, I just didn't quite get enough rest last night or my pillow was just a little bit of crooked, just kind of like those Israelites. I didn't like that manna that was miraculously given to them. And, you know, well, you know what? That person said this yesterday to me, uh, yes, yesterday to me at work, and I'm offended. And, and so I wake up grumpy the next morning and I flip on the word of God and I listen to the word of God. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, oh this is the Thursday of my dreams. This, this is thankful Thursday. Today I'm going to be thankful. Uh, and, and it changes everything because we don't live by the way things look in this world. If I focus on the way things look in this world, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, all you've got to do is turn on any news station, any radio station, any newspaper, any magazine, and let them tell you how bad the United States of America is right now. Our economy's bad, our political system's bad, our finances are bad, our families are bad, our churches are bad, there's people stealing, there's people killing, there's... I mean, oh my word, how in the world can you have any optimism about anything? Well, I can have optimism because I've got the word of God inside of me that tells me I live by faith, not by sight. And God has a good plan for me. And he's told me to go and he's told me to do. And I am. And yes, he's even warned me the resistance will come and it won't be comfortable. But we can overcome and we will overcome. We will overcome. What's the worst thing that can happen? I love what our pastor says. What is the worst thing that could happen? In that moment when, when God told him, do not fear, what was he afraid of? They were afraid of death. That's what they were. What do we really fear? What is our fear? That we won't live in our big fancy houses? I mean, seriously, can we not be happy if we don't have this great big fancy house? Can we not be happy if I don't drive that big fancy electric car out there? Really, is that where our happiness is? I mean, what do we fear? Do we fear, we fear death? Our pastor says it's a great day to live and it's a great day to die. And that's ingrained in me now. He says it enough. I mean, for crying out loud, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. And that's what we're fearing? Woo! Uh, wow! You know what? We don't have anything to fear, y'all. God's on our side. If God be for us, who can be against us? We don't have anything to fear. Um, verses uh, 21 in, I don't know what chapter. <laughs> I think it's still three. Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. So will the Lord do to all the kingdoms in which you are crossing. So 60, 60 towns, 
and 60 battles, 60 victories, and they're still doubting. And then a promise of, yes. I was just saying, because I mean, in the 60 cities part, so if you backed up to four, it tells you that they were all cities fortified with high walls and gates and bars. So it takes them straight back to where the promised land came uh -huh. in. They were all afraid of. <laughs> the promised land. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, okay, so then now he's making them go, they're having to walk it out anyway. Oh, yeah. They just missed out. They did. But 40 years later, you know, now yes. they're, they're walking it out. Well, they went around the mountain another dozen times, another 60 times to get right back where God originally promised them anyway. Oh, that'll preach. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done, that verse 21, Sorry. to these two kings. So will the Lord do to all the kingdoms in which you are crossing. You shall not fear them. For it is the Lord your God who fights for you. We don't even have to fight the resistance. Stop giving in to the resistance. Stop giving in to the temptation to be depressed. Stop giving in to the temptation to be doubtful. Stop giving in to the temptation of being scared for your health. Stop giving in to the, the Lord your God is with you. No matter what the resistance is, he's with you. So do I magnify the health issue, do I magnify God? Do I magnify the problems with my children or do I magnify God? Do I magnify the problems with my finances or do I magnify God? Whatever you magnify is what's going to go. Remember yesterday, the little pebble that I showed you? That little problem. I got this problem. And in God's eyes, it's that big. <laughs> See it underneath my fingers? It's that big. But I look at it and I look at it. And I look, I magnify, I magnify, I magnify, I, oh my word, there's a mountain in front of me I can't get over. Forgetting that all I have to do is speak to the mountain and it be gone. The mountains really are unbelief. Our only problem we have in our entire life is unbelief. Father, forgive us. How many promises for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. He fights the resistance, but we got to turn it over to him. He can't fight it if I'm holding the sword. He can't fight it if I've got the gun and I won't lay it down. He, 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 he can't fight it for me if I want to stand in front. And it's, i got to be front and center all the time. we got to die to self. That's what that die to self message is. It's the lesser of me so it can be more of him. Whew. Verse 25, please let me go over and see the good land. Oh, this is where Moses, okay, let me back up a little bit because, okay, yesterday God said, you keep intervening for these people. And so because of them, you're not going to the promised land. So 60 cities later, running around that mountain, how many dozens of times later, they're back where they started at the promised land. And Moses pleads with God. And I, in verse 23, and I pleaded with the Lord at that time saying, Oh, Lord God, you've only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty land. Now, do you all realize what Moses has seen up to this point? I mean, the miracles upon miracles upon miracles. He's been on the mountain with God Almighty. God passed by him and showed his glory to him. He wrote the New Testament. Uh, the Ten Commandments on a tablet for Moses. He was with Moses to the point <clears throat> that the glory shone on Moses to where people couldn't, couldn't gaze on him. And this statement, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness in your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven on, or on earth who can do such works? So he, Moses knew, he knew the best was yet to come. And mighty acts as you, as you, please let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that good hill country uh, across the Jordan. But the Lord was angry with me because of you. He's telling the Israelites again. <coughs> wow. I, I, I tell you, I, you know, I intend and I want to go back. I want to reread the scripture where God got angry because he hit the rock twice instead of obeying him. That's when he first learned he wasn't going to go over. But now we've read it twice now that he's not going crossing over because right here it says it, but the Lord was angry with me, Moses, because of you, the Israelites, and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, enough from you. Do not speak to me of this matter again. Whew. Okay, don't want God to get like that with me. <laughs> 
go up to the top and then he tells him he can go up to the top of the mountain and to lift his eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward and look at it with your eyes for you shall not go over this Jordan. Now, once again, I want you to see our father's heart. He's angry with Moses and he's even angrier with the people. And he's told Moses, no, you can't go. Um, and Moses asked him again, and he rebukes Moses to the point. He says, do not speak to this, to the, of this to me again. But he softens, and he lets Moses go to the hill, and he got to see it. Now, that's our father's heart. That is our father's heart. But charge Joshua. Now, again, he's already told him. Yesterday we learned he told him that Joshua is going to be the lucky man that gets to take him across. And, and again, rather than resenting, I mean, how many of us, has watched somebody else with their kids and been resentful? How many of us has watched somebody else be a grandma and were resentful? How many of us has looked at our neighbors and what our neighbor possesses and has and were, were envious? Uh, I mean, all of us have had those feelings, but, but Moses had the most glorious thing that he had lived his whole life for, and that was to lead the Israelites into the promised land, jerked away from him, taken away from him, and handed to the man next to him, Joshua. Joshua, who did not have the anointing of God Moses had, he didn't have the talents Moses had, he didn't have the presence of God with him that Moses had. I mean, look at all the things Moses could have looked at and said, he's so much lesser than me, and, but this is what, for a second time, God tells him. Moses charged Joshua and encouraged and strengthened him. For he shall go over at the head of the people, and he shall put them in possession of the land that you see. So we remained in the valley opposite. So God told him not only to just to turn it over to him, to give his rod of God to him and lay it all down himself. He didn't just tell him to just sit there idle. He told him to charge him. It's just, I, I think of a battery being plugged into electricity. He told him that he's going to get his energy from you. He told him to encourage him. He's going to get his, his, his confidence from you, Moses. And Joshua's, success depended on how Moses handled Joshua. Wow. That's a lot. Okay. Luke chapter six, verse 12 through 38. In these days, Jesus went out to the mountains to pray all night. He continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12. So he didn't choose his 12 until, um, he prayed all night long. He isolated himself. He prayed all night long, and then he chose his 12. And again, do a research on the lives of the 12 he chose. But even in today's text, as we read through it, um, it's, um, and, when, and when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot. So he makes mention of what Simon did for a living. Uh, look up what Zealots did. It was ugly. Uh, way worse than tax collectors. And then Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. God knew. God knew Jesus knew he would be his traitor. And he chose him. He still chose him. <clears throat> and so um, going on into verse 18, uh, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured and all the crowd sought to touch him for power came out of him and healed them all. We get a lot of uh, publicity over the woman with the issue of blood just reaching out and touching the hem of his garment. But right here, it said the multitudes was trying to get to him just to touch him for the power of one touch of Jesus Christ. And then that word all, he, he touched him for the power came out of him and healed them all, all. Why do we think we won't be healed? Uh, just do a word search on all, uh, just in the New Testament. Uh, you know, God's got me right here. I wrote it in my, in my um, the margin today, all. Every time I see the word all, God's got me to stop and think about all. And what's it saying about all here? And I write it in my margin. And I'm now to the point where every time I see the word all, I'm stopping and saying, wow, all will change your view on a lot of things. <laughs> uh, and he lifted his eyes 
but lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, and then he went into the Beatitudes, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. He's, do you know how much hope he's given us? You know, I, I may be depressed and I can't quit crying, but he's telling me when I weep, I'll soon laugh. I may be hungry now. I, I, my finances may be a wreck, but he promises me I'll be satisfied. Um, anyway, it just goes on and on. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you. I mean, how many of us can handle rejection and spurning and, and betrayal? We have such a hard time with it, but, but we're blessed. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and they revile you and they spurn you and they call your name evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Rejoice in that day. Rejoice. And what do you have to have before you can rejoice? you got to have joy. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. And when we have the joy of the Lord, we can rejoice when bad things happen. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich. And it goes on. But I want to start in verse 27, and I want to read through this. It's worth it. Um, I want everybody that's listening to this to hear this. But I say to you, says Jesus, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Really? Where are I? Just, just do a little spiritual check of yourself. I mean, just, wow. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Now, I'm telling you, you know, I hear people talk about all the time, people coming in and stealing things that your house has been broken into. I've had that happen. I've had every possession I owned stolen from me. So I'm not talking just off the top of my head. And, and, and we read these things. You know what I should have done when all those possessions were stolen? I should have blessed them and sent them on. Mm -hmm. I should have said, Father, somebody obviously needed them more than I do. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. Help them. Um, give to everyone who begs from you. Oh, wow. This says, give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. We don't give expecting something in return. We're not nice to somebody expecting somebody to be nice uh, back to us. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? It's so easy to love those that love us. For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? It's not a pleasing aroma to the Lord. That sacrifice is worthless in the kingdom of God. Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount, not even talking about interest. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting, lend. It says lend, lend, expecting nothing in return. And your, your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. He's kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. God is kind to the evil. Are we kind to him? Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. That'll put us all to prayer. Praise God, praise God. Uh, the Proverbs, whoever diligently, diligently seeks good, seeks favor, but evil comes to him who searches for it. I love you all. I love the revelation. I love our Father's heart, and I love that he's changing our heart, that we have the desires of his heart now. Uh, we're being changed from glory to glory. Praise God. Love you all. Have a great day.